Right, so good afternoon. Uh, I am uh, Senior Professor Daniel Huddo, the Head of, of School of Liberal Arts and in the Faculty of the Arts, Social Sciences and the Humanities at the University of Wollongong. It's uh, my great pleasure to welcome each and every one of you here today, and I can still see some polling in. Um, Luminaries, this special series, um, brings together leading UOW researchers, industry experts, and thought leaders for a one-hour conversation every fortnight. Um, we will discover how research and collaboration at the University of Wollongong is tracking global challenges. Today, we welcome colleagues in the School of Education, the School of Psychology, the School of Health and, and Society, the School of Liberal Arts, the School of Humanities and Social Inquiry, and uh, our own early start as we discuss how to embrace neurodivergence and autism in education. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge country. I've just come back from abroad from a trip to Europe, and I have to say uh, Australia is the most beautiful country uh, that I still know of, and uh, I really appreciate um, being able to stay here. And in this respect, I think we owe um, um, the elders past, present and emerging our greatest respects. On behalf of the university, I would like to acknowledge that Country for Aboriginal Peoples is an interconnected set of ancient and sophisticated relationships. The University of Wollongong spreads across many interrelated Aboriginal countries that are bound by this sacred landscape and intimate relation with that landscape since creation. From Sydney to the Southern Highlands, to the South Coast, from freshwater to bitter water, to salt, from city to urban to rural. The University of Wollongong acknowledges the custodianship of the Aboriginal peoples of this place and space has kept alive the, the relations between all living things. The university acknowledges the devastating impact of colonization on our campus's footprint and commits itself and ourselves to truth-telling, healing, and education. Now, here at UOW, we are passionate about empowering autistic and neurodivergent learners to achieve their educational and social potential. Before we dive into our panel, I'm delighted to let you know briefly about two new initiatives that are adding to what we already do. Um, the first is a new autism and neurodivergent alliance in which researchers, practitioners, and autistic and neurodivergent community members and their families will work together to eliminate barriers and create inclusive neurodiversity affirming communities and learning contexts. And if you are interested in joining us, please be in touch and there'll be um, ways of getting in touch um, out, outside of this um, uh, seminar itself. The second is a new partnership with Aspect who will soon be setting up two kindergarten classes and a year 12 class on our campus uh, here in Australia. We are looking forward to sharing research and teaching expertise together. Um, with that done, I would like to welcome our panelists for today. Um, Dr. Aida Huram is a lecturer in inclusive education at Southern Cross University. She is a well-being and belonging researcher with a focus on student experience, equity, and social justice. Having specialized in autism and being autistic herself, Ida is passionate about improving experiences of autistic students and staff in higher education and school settings. Welcome, Ida. Associate Professor Amanda Webster is the Academic Program Director for the Master and Graduate Certificate of Autism at the University of Wollongong. Amanda has worked for over 30 years with students and their families as a school leader, advisor, teacher, program director, and certified behavior analyst. Amanda's research focuses on creating meaningful social impact and aims to support the achievement and self-determination of autistic and neurodivergent individuals. Karina Beatty is a developmental educator and specialist in autism. She has worked in the early childhood and education sector for 15 years, working with children up to 12 years. Throughout that time, she has developed a passion for working with children who have a diagnosis of, diagnosis of autism and their families. Karina also has lived experiences of being a mom of children who identify as neurodivergent. So welcome, Karina. Dr. Kate Cro Croker 
is a senior clinical neuropsychologist and fellow of the Austra Australian Psychological Society. She has over 10 years experience in hospital settings, providing neurological assessments and therapy to people who have a rehabilitation and medical conditions, and currently works in our UAW psychology students uh, with our UAW psychology students at the North Hill Clinic. And finally, uh, so welcome, um, Kate. And finally, uh, Dr. Alan Jurgens has a PhD in philosophy and teaches at the University of Wollongong in both the philosophy discipline and for the Masters of Autism program. His philosophical work has focused on the theoretical basis of the development of social cognitive capacities in children and examining our empathetic understanding of others. In regard to neurodiversity and autism, his research has examined communication differences and models of disability for diagnosis and intervention. So welcome, Alan. Um, we encourage members of the audience to submit their own questions using a Q&A function. Um, and we will try to get through as many of those as possible in the background, but I will start off by actually turning to um, our panelists individually and asking them some pointed questions. So um, if I might just begin, um, I think uh, we might start with you, Amanda. Amanda, what, what is neurodivergence and how can we empower autistic and neurodivergent individuals to achieve their educational and social potential? There we go. I'm going to start with the first question, which is what is neurodivergence? Mm -hmm. And to understand that, we have to understand that in any society, the natural thing is we have, when we look at any characteristic, whether it be height or hair color or whatever, we have a big group of people that kind of cluster in similar characteristics. So when we look at height, we have a lot of people that are in this range of height. And then we have those people that are kind of outliers. They're either much shorter than that group or that average, and we have people that are much taller. Well, the same thing is true in um, how we process information around us, whether through our senses, through our, our uh, you know, uh, the way that we make sense of it in our, our heads or whatever. And so neurodivergence is just simply those group of people for whom process information and senses differently than the majority of people do. Now, some people process things a little differently, and some people process things a lot differently. So really, neurodivergence is just that. It's, it's that uh, it's processing things very differently or somewhat differently than the majority of people. So in a way, it's kind of understanding majority and majority in a way. Mm -hmm. How can we empower? Well, one of the things when you process things differently, unfortunately, a lot of people don't even realize how they process. There's a lot of things that happen as we grow and develop as babies into childhood and adulthood that we don't even realize we're doing in our brain. We don't realize how we learn to communicate. We don't realize that. And unfortunately, the majority of things out there kind of caters to what the majority is because it's catering to what they know. Um, and so what we have to do to empower people who do that differently is, first of all, listen and learn from them about what it is that they do differently so that we can change what we do to make sure that they're getting the right um, information, the right stimulus, the right um, guidance so that they can learn the way. For example, if you're in a school, a lot of learning is based on people looking at the speaker and imitating what they do. Well, mm -hmm. For some neurodivergent people, that's not a natural process. Mm -hmm. And sorry about that. <laughs> it's not a natural process. So if we know that, then we can change what we do to get their attention and make sure that they are, you know, being explicit. I want you to do what I do. Oh, okay. We just don't assume. So what we really have to do is allow people to learn in their own way, but we have to figure out what it is that we is that they need and also not base it on what works for me or what works for you and and also allow people to do things in different way and I think in schools this is so important is is to be flexible to really realize what it is we're trying to get people to understand and then allow them the flexibility to do that in a range of ways and I think and and also and this is the most important empowerment means 
we have to have them have say and autonomy. So um, I'm really big on self-determination and it's really giving individuals from their very early days on ways that they can feel connected to others, ways that they can develop a sense of their own competence and their own autonomy and having choices and a voice in things. And I think that's so important with all students, but particularly with students for whom may learn in different ways than we would typically expect. Excellent. Thank you so much, Amanda. That was a very rich answer. I mean, there's lots there I'd like to come back to, but I think we'll move on uh, because of the time constraints. Uh, I'd like to turn to um, Alan and then Kate, and I'll put the same question to both of you. Um, can you tell us about your current work in this area? Just give us a little bit of a praise of it. Yeah, so um, very briefly, the work that I'm currently doing in this area is I want to look at uh, the relationship between narratives and uh, neurodiversity and institutions. Um, so I think there's a lot of sort of underlying ableist narratives that structure our institutions and the practices that occur within them, uh, especially even within schools that actually cause still a lot of stigma uh, around being neurodivergent and a lot of obstacles for neurodivergent individuals in those environments. Um, so I think trying to look at sort of what some of these uh, narratives that cause the stigma and uh, cause these barriers might be and how we can sort of alter them, uh, which also I think requires identifying the kinds of narratives that destigmatize neurodiversity, that empower and support uh, those individuals as well. So we can sort of focus on the ones that are important to us um, and maybe try to defocus or, or cast off those ones that might be harmful. That's really helpful. Um, just a, a question. Um, the do you see that as connected to the assumptions that um, Amanda was just talking about when she was saying, like, when we approach this as teachers, how, how does that play into the assumptions that kind of are um, perhaps ambient in the way that people think about these topics? Well, I mean, in I think the most fundamental way, uh, I think there's assumptions that underlie what we even think education is, right? Like, what what is the the goal of having children or adults be in any sort of educational setting and depending on what we sort of you know assume that goal to be is really going to sort of structure the way that we do things within those settings and i think um some of the ways that we sort of assume that we should be doing education sometimes are, are very ableist minded in, in that sense so kind of looking at those which i think really importantly requires looking across the sort of social political dimension as well because that's a very much uh, sort of a, a deep aspect to all of that thank you alan thanks for that okay uh kate um turning to you can you tell us a bit about your current work in this area yeah, so um, I currently teach the master's level psychology students about the concepts of neurodivergence and neurodiversity. And um, within the clinic, the Northfield Psychology Clinic, I um, supervise the students to conduct cognitive assessments. And the assessments are for neurodevelopmental conditions. Uh, so our typical assessments we look at are things like um, ADHD, specific learning disorders, intellectual developmental disorders, giftedness. We do screening for autism assessments, but we don't do a thorough assessment for autism at the moment. Um, many of the student, the, many of our clients that we have come through the clinic are students of UAW or other students at um, schools or other universities. And the process of the assessment is not just to provide a diagnosis, but to look and help them to identify their strengths and their weaknesses and to identify strategies to, you know, utilize their strengths to support the weaknesses that they might have so that they can uh, perform better in this, um, yeah, ableist kind of, um, yeah environment that we have sure. um and yeah i also conduct research in adhd particularly right okay looking at how we can better improve the assessment processes and do you think they have to be changed significantly um yeah i think the uh, there are multiple problems with the assessment processes uh, there are there are multiple ways of Having an assessment, you can go through 
the medical model um, or you can come through the psychology model. Everybody does it so differently. So it, we're at the process really of exploring what is working and what's not working so then we can make improvements. But uh, definitely there is difficulties with access and um, it, it's a long process, especially mm. for adults. Right. Thank you so much for that, Kate. Okay. Um, I'm turning over to uh, Ayaida and Karina. Um, you, you're both specialists in this area, but importantly, you're also able to draw on your own lived experience. So Karina, could you perhaps talk, us, talk to us about the role of teachers in recognizing and honoring neurodivergent strengths in children? Yeah, sure. So for me, one of the biggest things that I work with my children in advocating um, is that their child, their staff, the staff at the school and the teachers that are working with them um, accept their neurodivergence and understand what it is for them. So, um, you know, it's what that looks like is not comparing them to other students in the school, um, neurotypical or neurodiverse, um, and then putting neurotypical expectations on them. It's about developing an understanding of how their brain may differ um, from others and also not to categorise all neurodivergent students in the same box because they're all very individual as well and so it's understanding the students strengths so when I'm working with the teachers for my children I we meet and we organize um, at the beginning of the year to really understand the profile of my of my children as as required by the teacher or even and they are usually included in this process mm -hmm. um and but it's also about acknowledging their challenges as well so we can develop tools and strategies that can support them in the environment so that they are um you know meeting their um it's a, a holistic approach but it's also meeting their social and emotional well-being um as well um so one of the ways that we have worked um with our schools um is really harnessing um, my youngest son particularly his special interest and utilizing some of that as his as some strategies to really support him when he's feeling um, you know that he's overwhelmed by the environment and things like that and really um, harnessing those um, special interests as, as, as a teaching practice and I think the other thing that's really important is that um, Teachers and schools really need to listen to the parents to help them develop the strategies that are used in the school because the parents at the end of the day know their child way better than anybody else. Um, but more importantly, involving the, um, the person, the neurodivergent individual in all aspects of this. So um, they are at the centre of any... Um, conversation that's that they're um, you know given those choices and control to build this um, sense of autonomy and agency as well as Amanda said before so yeah yeah, yeah. so um, so I'm just interested in the idea of the so you were saying about the uh, the use of the special interests how, how does how would that work out in the in the classroom um, so for, for um, I can only speak to what how it works for my for my own um, child. I do work with children as well, but um, it's going to be individual for everybody. So I'll just speak to my son and his special interests um, and his connection is with his pet chickens. So when he is feeling overwhelmed about something in the environment or the task that's been given to him, um, they they have chickens at the school. Um, so they utilize his special interest in the chickens to help regulate his emotions when he's feeling um, overwhelmed by um, the environment. So it's, it's not necessarily using it in the teaching practices, but it's helping they, um, for my son, it really helps him to be able to have that time to calm and be able to re back, um, re enter back into the, into the classroom. Right. 
Mm-hmm. Um, there are other times where they might use it. He might write a story about his chickens instead of the task that they've, the, the ta- writing task that they've been asked to write. So they're utilising his, that interest to motivate him in his, in the tasks, depending on the need of, of what it is that they've got to do. Right. So it sounds like they have to adopt a, a rather flexible uh, approach and then come back in on things later on. Uh, that's really useful. That, that concrete example, I think, really helps. Um, so thank you for very much for that, Katrina. No worries. Um, I'll turn over to Aida. Um, what 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 does this look like, this um, uh, attempt to recognize and honor neurodivergent strengths in, in the university context? Um, could you say a few words about that for us? Absolutely. Um, Well, I think in the university context, I think um, we really have a very long way to go. We've done a lot of, we've got a lot of progress, uh, but we really are really just still starting. So the first thing I would like to say about the higher education um, is more around really um, creating an understanding of what autism is amongst our faculties. Um, So for us who are involved in autism research and teaching uh, or who are autistic, for us it might come naturally and we think, yep, we think everybody might um, understand it. Uh, But when we start to work with, um, you know, um, others, we realise that it's really still, we still have a long way to go as a society and also, of course, in the in the higher ed um, uh, space as well. So I really like to bring it back to the basics and to say we need to build that understanding, what is autism, so that we can then um, remove any um, bias or, or unconscious bias that we, we may have. Uh, and I think I've been reading through the comments and someone mentioned, you know, even TV shows and things like that can significantly skew our understanding of what autism is. Uh, And so I think that that's kind of where we need to start. And then by creating an understanding, we are then able to actually create a genuine sense of belonging for our students, because, um, you know, it's belonging is very important and it has been linked even in my own research to academic success. Uh, And so once we create that, um, then, you know, students tend to thrive and, and feel genuinely welcome in the space. Um, so that's kind of, you know, uh, and I think once we've done that really well, um, then we can put strategies in place that support students. Um, and so one of the strategies that I like to use in all of my classes, uh, whether I have autistic students there or not, is universal design for learning. And I just feel that it should really be uh, our approach should be about all students. And that way we are catering to uh, autistic and non-autistic students. Um, So, you know, this is something that my students over the years have told me, particularly my autistic students, they really find that that helps them quite a lot. uh, And that really this, um, uh, or the, the opportunity to be able to unmask, if you will, uh, to just be their authentic selves um, really, really helps them. So I think so to bring it back, understanding is the first thing so that we can genuinely um, um, yeah, include everybody in our, in our space. Thank you. Thank you for that, Aida. Um, one question I just had based on what you said, I mean, um, and I'm sure you'd, you would maybe can say more about this is that um, uh, so we talk about understanding autism, but there's a lot of diversity within autism as well. So um, well, that seems uh, an interesting point. We, we need to be able to perhaps understand those diverse styles and approaches, even within that, and not think that there's just a uniform uh, uh, approach. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And I think Amanda talked about that uh, earlier on, you know, and used some really beautiful analogies. We are all very, very different. Uh, And, you know, I like to look at it from my, you know, just just from my experience. Um, I might have some probably borderline savant abilities, but then I also have some challenges. Uh, And so just because I'm so gifted in in one area, it doesn't mean that I don't have challenges and require support in others, other areas. So understanding that we are all very different. I think Amanda used the height as an example uh, is really important. So absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. My Uh, pleasure. And look, I'm going to swing back to Amanda now and ask a a further question. So Amanda, in recent educational policies and legislation, there's a discussion of a human human rights model of practice. Um, What does this mean in terms of education for neurodivergent students? Um, 
it's really interesting because um, our national disability insurance scheme, our disability uh, discrimination act, but particularly the disability standards uh, policy for education in this country are based on that human rights model. I will argue they don't always implement things with that, but what that means is, um, I think Kate talked about the medical model and the medical model is the model in which basically we focus on changing and fixing individuals with difference or disability. And it's focused on making them, <clears throat> pardon me, but for want of a, a better analogy, less autistic, less neurodivergent, making them more, um, get rid of those things and really about fixing them. A social model, which you'll also hear a lot about is about no, that, that disability isn't about the individual, it's about the environment's failure to accommodate that individual. Whereas the human rights model is really about it's, it's, it's more like the social model, but with some critical differences in the fact that the focus isn't just on, you know, the individual or the environment, it's actually on doing what we need to do to enable the individual to do everything they want and can possibly do in their life. And that means not just the, not the right to succeed, but also the right to fail sometimes too, and to be, you know, have the same rights as everybody else. And sometimes we do hold neurodivergent individuals to a higher standard or not there's a, you know there's been historically a control factor it doesn't even let individuals you know do the mischievous or things that other people would do um but the human rights model is really about focusing on the voice and the empowerment and, of that individual and it's also about yes we absolutely need to change the environment we need to look first at what the environment or the expectations does that need to change and i think you know, Alan talked about what is education about? I think that's a really good question. Are we focusing on the wrong things in education to start with? But it also recognizes that within each individual that we all have little things about ourselves that maybe we do need to improve, we do need to get better, and, and or that may be barriers. For example, a lot of neurodivergent individuals that I deal with have really significant levels of anxiety and feel that that is a real barrier. And, and it, no matter what we do in the environment, that anxiety is still there. So the more we can help them to actually manage their own anxiety is also as important as, of course, changing the environment to not have those things that would trigger as much anxiety. But again, there are different things that it recognizes that, you know, it's about making yourself, you know, you're helping yourself to learn and grow and be your best self. But also, of course, first and foremost, changing the environment and doing what we can to focus on the things that that person needs to make a difference in their life. Um, and, and I think that the word rights is really the focus there. And as I said, I, we've all talked about this, but really about that person having a say, that person having the information they need to make the right decisions and the supports to um, express those decisions in whatever way they need to, even if they you know, aren't really proficient at using oral language, expressing it in a different way or something like that. So it's really allowing those person to have those, those rights to experience successes and failures, just like everybody else. Um, but to make their own decisions in their life. Okay. Thank you, Vanda. Um, well, um, I'm going to move on and I'm going to pose this next question um, to everyone on the panel. Um, and so maybe I'll, uh, maybe we can just, um, I can circulate around um, and people can give me their answers. I'll, I'll read it first. And uh, so we know how important that decisions about research and teaching, um, that decisions about be made with genuine representation or community. We we'll see examples in some cases, but I mean, if we took this on a broader level and thought, well, what what's the next step for this? And uh, um, I think I'll start with. Um, Kate. Kate, are you there? Hi, okay. Kate. Oh, hello. I don't, maybe my internet connection went bad. I didn't actually hear the question. I'll repeat it. I so think it was Dan's. Yeah. All right. Oh, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I lost power. It could be that. 
Um, um, so I just wanted to uh, ask, um, so we know how important that decisions about research and teaching, um, that when we make those decisions, that they're made with genuine representation from autistic and neurodivergent community members and their families. We just heard examples of that. Um, but where do you see this research and teaching going next in light of that? Um, so where do you think, what are the next steps for us? Um, I think that we're only really just starting to do this work where we are genuinely having people, neurodivergent people involved in the research. So I think we need to do more of that. Mm -hmm. um, and to, yeah, look at all different aspects of neurodivergent. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you think, um, so what, what would you think would be the most important thing that we might do um, at university levels or in schools that, that would be an important change? Do you have anything in mind? Or... Um, I don't have anything particular in mind. I think that in terms of universities or schools, I, I think that um, some of the things that Amanda was talking about before looking at ways that we can adapt the environment so that it is um, more suitable, more helpful. Um, and I think we need to look at the, the different models that we, you know, the medical model, how we can make that fit in with the neurodivergent thinking. It's very, it is challenging doing assessments because we need to fit to the medical model to get people the funding and supports right. that they need. Mm -hmm. So looking, I guess some of the research I'm looking at is how do we do an assessment, write a report that's in that framework, but then try and explain it in a way that's not in that framework. It, it's quite challenging. That's very interesting, Kate. So I was just thinking there myself, what, given what you said, maybe it's, it's also some policy level changes uh, that really mm. need to take place before we can get into some of the, so at, at a more macro scale, before we can make the adjustments properly at a micro scale. Um, mm, I agree. I, I, Ada, I just wonder what you might think about that question. I know you've given some answers to it already, but I just, to kind of catch what you think now. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, um, Professor Dale. Um, I actually believe that I'm, I'm a big believer of, like we've included autistic um, population now finally in research and, and all of this, and that's great, but I think that we can really do more. I think that we need to allow opportunities for autistic uh, researchers and for autistics in general, uh, professionals, um, to, to actually be involved in really big decision-making processes. And I think that we need more of uh, the autistic uh, population in leadership roles so that they, they are genuinely included in the decisions around policy and around development of uh, research as well. So that's kind of where, where I think we, we really have some gaps and I think that we are getting there. Uh, and that's where I see um, research and teaching um, going in the future. Excellent. Hopefully. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, Alan, what, do you, what have you got for us? Yeah, so I would just like to speak to this a little bit. Um, I'd gone to an event hosted by the University of Sydney a couple months ago, where this was a, a really central point of the forum discussion. Um, and I think that the main thing that I took away from that is, uh, again, really re-examining how deeply embedded sort of ableist expectations are within these types of institutions. Um, because while we have gotten better about including uh, neurodivergent individuals uh, with our research in terms of co-production, um, and you know, it's inevitably that you'll find some neurodivergent researchers at universities, some of which might be working on this research, um, those sort of professions, uh, you know, research within academic institutes are still very much something that is sort of exclusionary towards neurodivergent individuals. Um, partly due to policies around workload expectations, um, around lack of support for them in those institutions. Um, and I think we can probably see a similar thing going on even outside of tertiary education in primary and secondary education. I mean, right now, everything you hear about that is the, the lack of teachers and the lack of support for teachers to stay in that profession. Well, if you're a neurodivergent individual who you know, faces difficulties and, and additional obstacles and burdens than a neurotypical individual, 
um, it's going to make staying in that difficult profession even harder, right? Where your your personal expertise would be even more useful. Um, so I think you know when I talk about the the need to look at those sort of ableist narratives that underlie a lot of the practices and policies that we have in our institutions, that's one of the things that I think you know we really need to look at is how sort of the expectations we set in in not just research and, and teaching um, professions, but in a variety of processions still creates barriers for for people uh, who might be neurodivergent or disabled uh, in in general in any sort of way. Um, Great. So thank you very much for that, Alan. Uh, I'm going to ask Car Karina if she what her take on this is as well. Yeah, sure. So I think um, I agree with um, everything that else has been said so far. But I think one of the things that we really need to be mindful of is that when um, when we're working with teachers, they don't always necessarily know the information that will help individual children. So it's really about empowering parents to advocate for their children and what that could look like in a school environment um, and some education around that for both parents and um and uh, teachers and school staff and what that can look like in in a um, in our research and um, you know the way that we're mm -hmm. teaching our teachers wow. um, to be able to support the children it's impact it's it's giving them the information that they need mm -hmm. to support our children right so educating the educators yeah 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 <laughs> Very good. Um, and I'll turn finally uh, to Amanda and I'll get your comment on what you think, we, where we want to go next in teaching and research, what the priorities are. I think when we're talking about education in specific, which is what I'll focus on, I am, there's a couple of things we said. First of all, Ada talked about greater role in leadership. And I do want to point out that South Australia has just announced um, a, a, a minister in their area and one of our colleagues, Dr. Emma Goodall, who's an autistic researcher, has just left a positive partnerships to actually be a head researcher and lead in that office, which is fantastic at a government level. Um, that's just been announced recently. So I think that's a really positive thing. I'd like to see more ideas of that. But I want to go back to where I think we need to be going to something Alan said. And, and I think we need to be focusing in two big areas in regards to education. One is actually looking at education in general. And, and, and Alan said something about what is the aim and what are we focusing on? And I think a lot of the structures that are currently in education in general are not conducive to the things that are happening. For example, Karina mentioned, you know, not every teacher can learn everything that they need to know about every student. There's no way you can do that. What we need to do is find better ways to allow teachers and parents to collaborate. And right now we don't have good systems and structures to do that. We don't have good systems and structures both within health, with therapists and within schools to get that kind of information going. We don't, we've got a lot of focus on getting standard stuff in my school and not enough allowing teachers to have the flexibility to feel they have the freedom to bring those social emotional skills. They're getting too much pressure to do academics. So one area we need to look at, I think, is an education in general, and mm -hmm. this would make education better for lots of students. The second one, I think, and this is something that I'm going to be working in and I've been talking to Ada a bit about, is really learning more from autistic neurodivergent individuals about how we construct learning experiences that support them. And right now, we know a lot about learning theory. We don't know a lot about neurodivergent learning theory. And so personally, that's something that I plan on looking at a lot more. And also, how can we use that not just in school settings, but in therapy settings, rather than using that intervention model, let's talk about what we know about how we get people to learn and how we get them empowered to be lifelong learners. And I think that's what we need to be really focusing on. Um, and that's and also how we're maximizing what's already there. So for early childhood, rather than just sending everybody to early intervention where they go to therapists or think, why aren't we maximizing early childhood programs as a platform and then expand on that with other services and stuff. So I think there's a lot of areas in core practice that we need to look at, but also we need to learn more from neurodivergent individuals about how we can construct these things in ways that will make the best sense for them. And I would say impact a lot of other people as well. Right, thank you so much, Amanda. Um, 
that's excellent. Um, thank you all for, for, for being able to uh, address that. Um, I'd like to now um, spend the last bit of time that we've got um, maybe just picking up a few questions from the audience. I'm not sure I'm going to, I'm pretty sure, in fact, I won't get to all of them. I'm looking at the Q&A. Uh, there's a good number there, but there's, I think, plenty more in the chat. Um, but um, it may be that we'll be able to um, respond to some of those questions outside of the actual seminar itself. But let me just turn to some uh, that are prominent here. I'll throw them open and um, as long as we don't step on each other's toes too much, I'll make that more of an open mic uh, maneuver. So uh, perhaps you might want to nominate if you uh, if you're on the panel, you'd like to if you think this is a question you'd uh, want to come in on. Um, so I'd say uh, one of the first one here, and I think it touches on several of the themes that we've already raised uh, and, and maybe makes it a little bit more concrete where these things might uh, where more thinking might be necessary. The first question uh, comes from. Emma Grimer, if I can, if I've pronounced that correctly. Um, what is the process when advocating for support for teacher aides in mainstream education in primary schools to ensure the needs for neurodivergence is met? Has anyone got a, a, a opinion on that from the panel? I can certainly answer that. I don't know if Ada wants to too, but uh, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to answer that with throwing something else back. Um, this is actually an area I work in a lot. Um, the, the main thing that we need to be advocating for is not necessarily more teacher aides. It's the type of strategies that need to be implemented. And then we can advocate if we need teacher aides to do them. What we know by and large is that a lot of teacher aides are not being used in the right way to actually empower or enable that. What we're doing is often creating dependence on teacher aides rather than empowering the individual. So what we need to be doing first is to make sure that we're talking about the program or strategy that's needed. And then we use that as a form to say, yeah, to do that, we need some teacher aids or we need a, a computer or what are the alternative things that need to. So we need to be talking about programs and strategies first and teacher aids as a resource to do that second. Um, all too often um, things. As far as, you know, there's a lot of things going on with helping teacher aides to have more knowledge, but ultimately helping teachers to have more knowledge to direct the teacher aides is a more effective strategy. Right. Thanks. Thanks for answering that for us, Amanda. I was just going to bring in Ida as she had any more comments on that, but if not, I'll move to the, the next question. Ida, do you have something you want to add? No, that was just perfect. I couldn't agree more with Amanda. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. I'll try um, another question here from, if I forgive me if I mispronounced this, Sahar Korami. Um, and this, I think, did touch on several of the things that people were pressing for. What is the balance between providing opportunities for individuals to learn in their own way, but also requiring to meet the requirements of the workforce in their, or, uh, in their field of study? So how, how do we... Um, I suppose, balance that out with the needs of what is likely to be a push for um, outcomes that are standardized and yet at the same time individualized in the form of teaching. So who would like to jump in on that? Well, I mean, I, 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 I maybe I, say I, some I, of my I, thoughts yeah. regarding that, which would just be one that, you know, it's a difficult process to always, you know, have some sort of standardization, especially regards to certain specialty professions that require standardization for things like safety. Um, but I think also, you know, uh, it's sort of a, a two way street in the sense that we also need to sort of think about changing some of the expectations within professions. I mean, that was sort of the, the point that I was trying to make regards to uh, making sure that there's more neurodivergent researchers doing research. Um, it's not just about, you know, uh, making room for them, but it's actually changing the expectations of what's required of a, a researcher so that there is room for them. Um, similarly, uh, we can think about that in regards to other types of professions as well. Um, you know, the idea that uh, the requirement is, is, you know, a 30, well, I'm American, so I wanted to say like a 40 hour week, work week. Um, is something that should be standardized and, and everyone should be capable of doing is maybe you know problematic in itself right that uh, that expectation is a sort of ableist expectation and that we have to sort of change that so there's there's i think some room in there 
about thinking about how we want to sort of change the expectations required for certain professions. Obviously, you know, there's some limitations regarding the professions themselves, right? Um, we still want to have standards for things like doctors and emergency workers and engineers. Uh, but I think there's there's room for for give and take there, and that's where it's important to sort of analyze and understand. Um, you know, what, where are these standards actually coming from and, and what's the motivation behind the standard? Um, just like we would in, in looking at education, right? Like why, why is this a standard and should it continue to be the standard, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, I'm going to throw open another question. This one, I think this is not a proper name from anonymous attendee. Um, uh, and this question is, what is the general position on recognizing individuals, um, sorry, um, who use self-diagnosis via online resources? Uh, so does anyone have any comment on that? I guess I could comment. Um, I think people can uh, utilize self-diagnosis. There is no need necessarily to go and have a formal diagnosis unless you want to uh, get formal services, which is where you're going to require it because they won't accept a self-diagnosis. Um, but yeah, self-diagnosis is perfectly fine and there is no, not necessarily any reason to go and get a diagnosis except for yeah, getting formal supports or if you want to interact with a service to um, get some suggestions and strategies and supports, but you could potentially do that without a formal diagnosis as well, just depending on the service. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna move to another. I'm gonna see if I, how many more I can get in before we come to a close. Um, Madini uh, Dahal I, uh, asks, um, what is the difference between autism and neurodivergence? Um, what are the supporting strategies for neurodivergence children in preschool? Anyone want to um, give an indication here? Well, I can answer that if nobody else wants to. Okay. The main difference is autism is a very specific um, form or aspect of neurodivergence, but there's a lot of other neurodivergent forms of neurodivergence, such as you know, people with attention issues, um, people with learning differences, uh, dyslexia, things like that. So there's a lot of different forms of people that think and feel differently. Autism is just one of those. How we can do things in preschool um, is kind of a, a, a challenging thing. I think, again, preschool in, in the best sense actually lends itself really well because preschool should be about exploring and explaining things. I think the, the, the real challenge with um, children in preschool is presenting things in different way and also sometimes putting up some additional structure. So for example, I've been in preschools that it's, you know, kids just kind of free flow and choose what they want to do, et cetera. Well, sometimes for some individuals, you need to put up some structures. Like when I was working in preschool, we would have centers where, you know, there was only so many slots. And if those slots were full, you had to go to another center. So we didn't get people crowded. Or I had little placemats on the floor where people would sit so they didn't sit on top of each other. Now that didn't inhibit their choice, but it gave them some additional structure. Or you could put things up in visuals that give visual diagrams or things like that. So they have things presented visually as well as orally. Um, you might have a lot of preschools I've been to, for example, have little pictures. Where things, where things go and those are really supportive or, you know, they have little cues for when you come to the circle time and when you're in circle time, you can sit on the mat or you can sit in a chair. So again, it's that sort of balance of flexibility to do things in different ways, but also some additional structures and supports there to support people who process things in different ways. And I think one of the biggest things for children in early childhood is promotion of communication in different ways and whether visually, through gestures, through objects, or through words. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Um, this is a rather longer question, but I'm, I'm gonna throw it out. Uh, it comes from uh, Melissa Murphy, and she writes, um, I'm not sure which professional this question is best suited to. We are currently teaching a modified version of the PALS, P-A-L-S, 
program at our preschool and a parent of a neurodivergent child has raised this as a possible concern. We do modify this program already and are happy to do further, but wonder what other professionals think about teaching social skills and emotional regulation programs, such as the zones of regulation in EC settings. And thank you. So she throws that open. Who would like to uh, maybe come back on this? Sadly, I think that one's going to come back to me again because I'm That's probably one of the, one of the ones that knows those terms the most. Thanks. Um, I, look, I think it depends on what perspective you're coming from. Um, PALS is a good program. I don't know what the, the person's concern was, but you know, there may have been a valid concern in how it was being done. Um, I think that teaching social skills, of course, in preschool is important, but it depends on how we're teaching it. Yes. And, it and, and I will argue that some of the programs that focus on emotional regulation and self-regulation are all from a neurotypical standpoint. They aren't from the standpoint of the child particularly or specifically the neurodivergent child. And I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm probably gonna get in trouble for this, but Zones of Regulation, which is a very popular program, for example, actually has no real research behind it supporting it for autistic or neurodivergent individuals. And actually I have very concerns about how it's done and it doesn't really approach the reasons. And a lot of self-regulation programs, the other problem that I personally have seen with it is a lot of times they don't validate the feelings. And I've seen them used a lot. And I'm not, I'm not saying you're doing this, but where the child is very angry and they're angry for a good reason. And they say, oh no, you need to regulate. You have regulation problems. I said, no, you need to listen to him. He's mad because this happened. So I think sometimes those programs are used to invalidate and diminish the person rather than to actually listen to and validate those feelings. So um, right now I'm seeing a real overuse of those words, regulation, self-regulation, emotional regulation. And, and I think it's, it's not so much them and how, you know, what they are, it's in how they're used. Um, whereas what we really want to be doing is having things that we really teach children to be aware of their body and what their body is doing, being aware of what that means and being aware of what they can do. If I'm feeling too tired, if I'm feeling too energetic, what can I do to change myself and to empower them to take action for themselves and to recognize their own strengths, their own body signals. And I think that's where we want to be focusing. And of course, to connect with other children that they share interest with and to, you know, you know, do things in a way that works for them with other children and not making all children always play together and things like that. Okay, thanks. Thanks again, Amanda. Um, I'm gonna turn now to a question from uh, Jonathan Allen. Um, uh, he writes, apart from assessment, ILPs and building that relationship with families, what other strategies would you recommend that can empower neurodivergent students at the secondary education level. What more could be done here? Anyone have any thoughts? I don't want to be answering all of these, but I can <laughs> answer it if you want to Well, thank you, Amanda. I'll just, A lot of these are very education specific, obviously. Um, <laughs> Look, Jonathan, I think a strategy that I would love to see in all high schools for all children, and, you know, as a parent of two grown children that went through high school, you know, I would have loved to see my kids do this. I would love to have all kids have sort of their own little goal setting passport tool where they they're continually documenting and reflecting and they're getting opportunities in class to link this, their strengths the needs, what they need people to do to support them, what they want to be learning and how they're going to take strategies, goals they have, sort of a, a self-planning, self-determination tool that they're using and modifying it as they get a little older to start to really plan toward their school exit. That to me is so empowering. And yet we don't do this enough with anybody in high school. And then what happens is they get to about year 11 and we go, okay, so what do you want to do when you leave school? And they look at us with blank faces. So I think the more we get them to be sort of in charge of that, well, what is it I'm going to be able to do? What is my plan? But we can also build it into lessons. You know, I've got an essay. So what's my plan for that? How am I going to pick this out? Oh, what's an area that might trip me up? There's lots of different ways that we can build that in every day in, in, in classes. And I think secondary school is, well, you should be doing it all the way through, but secondary school is really paramount. 
Thanks. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I'm going to, I think this is probably our last question that we'll have time for if, if, if we have an answer. I'm going to turn to one from Gemily Stevenson. What forms of support can we give to children who have no official diagnosis and so cannot access third party support like OT and et cetera? Anyone have any views about that? Amanda? <laughs> uh, I, just, yeah, sorry. I, 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 I assume they're talking about in school, but are they talking about in general? Um, I, I, Do you know? Yeah, okay. I have to clarify that. Um, well, in, in school, there's all kinds of things we can be doing that, like universal design that um, Ada mentioned, that um, there's lots of things in school that doesn't matter if we have an OT or things or official diagnosis that we can use. And in fact, the Australian curriculum says that we can modify the change and it's not dependent on a child having a diagnosis. There are many children out there from other groups, you know, immigrant groups, whatever, um, that need support as well. At home, I think there's so many things that parents can be doing. And I know that we've been looking at this within some of the groups I'm running, you know, that parents can be doing. And I don't mean sitting down and teaching lessons to your child every day. First of all, I think that's very hard for most parents. And I speak as a parent. Um, I'm talking about, you know, having your child have experiences where you think, okay, well, I'll just... I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that I give these couple of little questions before we go, or I'll, I'll give them this little thing to jot down some notes or take pictures, or, you know, it's really knowing what you want your child to do and, mm -hmm. and how to really craft opportunities and experiences and the right feedback at the right time and the right prompt. And Karina might have some bit more on that, um, but I, mm -hmm. it, there's so many things that can be done in so many environments um, that um, it, it shouldn't depend on a therapist. Right. So, I mean, maybe a thought there is that some of the general educational practices could learn from a bit more of a tailored approach. So in that sense, it, it, it could um, help by thinking that most of us have um, very diverse ways of thinking and approaching questions and problems. So the more sensitized we are to that, the probably the better. Um, well, thank you for that. Um, I think we will have to wrap it up uh, here. Um, so I really want to give a, a very big thank you to Aida, uh, Karina, Amanda, Alan, and Kate for joining us this afternoon. Uh, thank you also to our audience. We hope you enjoyed the discussion. Um, we mentioned earlier that we are in a process of setting up a new neurodivergence and autism alliance here at the University of Wollongong. And if you're interested in joining us, please be in touch. Um, this event was recorded, so everyone who registered will receive a link to the recording via email. So I want to thank you again and please have a very good evening.